Welcome back to Space This Week. It has been a couple of weeks since my last news video, unfortunately, because I was competing in the SpaceCon 2023 Kerbal Esports event in Paris, so I couldn't make a video for last Monday, but I'm back now, here to cover the last seven days of spaceflight news, as well as catch you up on the latest Starship happenings. And we have some big news there, with the announcement of the mysterious Starship version 2, military tensions rise in the east as North Korea launches a spy satellite to orbit, China and Russia both launch secretive satellites of their own, Ariane 6 roars on its launch pad, and much, much more. Let's jump in. It finally happened! Again! The second launch of Starship, and I was out of the country when it happened, so I couldn't even make an episode of Space this week to cover one of the main subjects covered in this show. Timings can be cruel sometimes, but hey, I was out making some epic Kerbal content for you all, so you can look forward to that video when it's out, I guess. Anyway, I know at this point you've probably all been reading and watching content about the ups and downs of IFT2, so I'm not really going to spend much time talking about it in this video, but I feel like I should at least acknowledge it before talking about the other Starship stuff. And there's a lot of other Starship stuff to discuss. Firstly, and okay, actually this one is still kind of about the launch since it's about the damage dealt to stage zero, or rather, lack thereof. Starship Gazer captured some photos of the pad in the immediate aftermath, and really, it looks like it just needs a fresh coat of paint and nothing else. A little later on, Elon posted that the pad was in great condition with no refurbishment required to stage zero prior to the next launch. Yep, a big problem that happened with the first flight test of Starship was the destruction of the launch pad, which was not only a major contributing factor to all those engine issues on Booster 7, but was also a major reason why the wait was so long for flight number 2. And I don't just mean that in the sense that SpaceX had to rebuild the pad, build, install, and test the water deluge system and the steel plate infrastructure, in addition to getting Booster 9 and Ship 25 ready, I'm also referring to a major factor that delayed the launch for so long, and that was the length of time the Fish and Wildlife Service spent conducting their environmental review, which was what held up the FAA from issuing a launch license for so long. So what comes next? Elon has purported that SpaceX want to launch the next integrated flight test of Starship before the end of the year, but surely approval is going to prevent this. Happily, no, because no changes are needed to the ground infrastructure, specifically no installation of deluge systems that can affect the environment, environmental review will therefore not be required again, unless SpaceX decides to make drastic changes for some reason, which I can't see a reason for, personally. That being said, the FAA will definitely be running another mishap investigation following the second flight of Starship, because although SpaceX considered the flight a success, it obviously didn't go quite as planned. The Starship failed to reach its target orbit and self-destructed, and the booster didn't splash down in the Gulf of Mexico, instead, again, self-destructing. Because both vehicles didn't reach their intended targets, an investigation report will have been triggered. This is just standard though for any loss of vehicle situation, even in this case where neither vehicle was expected to survive their eventual impacts. However, I imagine that this investigation will be quicker than the last, because ultimately, the flight was far more successful than IFT-1, and this investigation will be a SpaceX-led investigation into what happened during the flight that led to termination of the vehicle, and what fixes are needed before Flight 3. It'll go like this. SpaceX will write a list of corrective actions, and then submit this list to the FAA, who will either accept it outright or make some suggestions about other items that need to be added. Either way though, this will be very much led by SpaceX, so there shouldn't be too much bureaucratic red tape in the way. So there you go. I guess that was a pretty poor attempt at not covering the Starship launch too much, but you know, whatevs, it's important we talk about future launches too, and also future generations of Starship. Elon made an intriguing post, a picture of the four fully stacked and tiled Starship prototypes, with a caption that these are the last of the V1s. He then elaborated, uh, a bit, on what version 2 would be. It'll be bigger, presumably, because it will hold more propellant, have reduced dry mass, and improved reliability. So yeah, pretty broad things that can be interpreted many different ways. It's unclear if there'll be a booster version 2, or if this is just for the ship. I'm also not sure why they didn't go with Mark II instead of V2, since in rocketry, V2 usually refers to a German-built rocket that was the grandfather to the modern rockets we see today, but was unfortunately designed for bad purposes by some bad people. 
The reason why production of version 1 is probably ending is because these four ships will need upgrading and retrofitting based on the data learned from both IFT-1 and IFT-2, and data from subsequent flights for the remaining ships. There's ultimately only so much that can be achieved from retrofits. It's likely much easier to start from a clean slate and build the new ships and boosters from scratch with the data they have, especially given SpaceX's general approach to building Starships quickly and then rapidly evolving the designs. But yes, Starship version 2. So many things it could be. I think that a hot question on the minds of many is, will we see it have the six RVAC engines that was planned quite some time ago for future Starships? More RVACs means more thrust, which means faster time to orbit and therefore less time spent fighting gravity, resulting in hopefully greater payloads to orbit. I know this would increase the dry mass, something that Elon mentioned would go down with version 2, but this probably refers to the wet dry mass ratio, so the added weight of the engines doesn't offset the ratio because of the increased propellant mass being added as well. Though of course Elon's post is rather open to interpretation, so let me know what you think in the comments down below. Will Starship version 2 have six RVAX or will we stick with three? And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying the flight so far, leaving a little like really helps me out and goes a long way, so it's always very much appreciated. Anyway, remaining to the subject of the number of engines, there is also the possibility that the engines themselves will be lighter, as rumours are flying that Raptor 3 is right around the corner, which will presumably have lower mass and higher performance than Raptor 2. Starship version 2 may well start out with Raptor 2 and then transition to Raptor 3, like how we saw version 1 go from Raptor 1 to Raptor 2. Another thing that will almost certainly be different on Starship version 2 will be the flaps. Usually, when a Starship prototype is scrapped, the flaps are spared and then reused later. A recent example of this was the aft and forward flaps of the scrapped Ship 22, which were donated to Ship 28 and 29. However, Ship 33's nose cone was recently scrapped and its flaps were scrapped as well, implying that the new generation will be different. Elon has stated the intention for the ship forward flaps to change in upcoming versions of Starship, making them smaller and more leeward, which makes me anxious. I really like the aesthetic of the current flaps, and having them be smaller and more leeward might not look as cool. Now I know this is totally irrelevant because Starship is all about function over form, but you know, it just looks so cool the way it is right now. <laughs> anyway, over the past seven days, SpaceX pulled off two orbital launches, both of which were Starlink missions. The first was last Monday, Starlink Group 7-7. 22 Starlink V2 minis were carried to orbit from Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 4E, and following stage separation, the first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. This first stage has now completed 15 flights in total. The other Falcon 9 mission last week was two days later on Wednesday, this time Starlink Group 6-29. The rocket launched from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40 with 23 Starlink V2 satellites on board, and after stage separation, the first stage successfully landed on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Interestingly, this marked this booster's 15th overall flight as well. North Korea made another launch attempt of its Choloma-1 launch vehicle on Tuesday. So far, they've tried to launch this rocket to orbit twice this year, but both attempts failed. This time, however, they didn't, and they've claimed that the rocket successfully placed the Maligyong-1 satellite to low Earth orbit. The satellite is described by North Korea as a reconnaissance satellite that will be used to spy on South Korean and American targets. In response, South Korea has suspended parts of its 2018 agreement with the North aimed at lowering military tensions, including resuming surveillance flights along the border, breaching the no-fly zone established under the agreement. We also saw China make a launch last week, on Thursday. A Long March 2D lifted off from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center, carrying three Hulian Wang satellites to low Earth orbit. Not a lot is really known about the nature of the payload, but official sources have stated that the satellites successfully entered the planned orbit and will carry out the mission of testing satellite internet technologies. We saw a Soyuz launch last week from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in Russia. It carried the Razdan-1 satellite to low Earth orbit, which is reportedly a new electro-optical reconnaissance satellite. Little else is known about this launch, and I don't actually have any launch video for this one either, so it'll be some other Soyuz launch on screen for illustrative purposes. As for Europe and the ESA, things aren't so hot with their launch vehicles right now. 
Vega C is still grounded due to technical issues, Ariane 5 is finished, and the only other launch vehicle was Soyuz, and because of the war in Ukraine, this isn't an option. So right now, Europe doesn't have its own launch vehicle. But things hopefully won't stay that way for too much longer. Last week, Ariane Space conducted a full-stage engine hot fire test of the Ariane 6 on the launch pad at French Guiana. During the test, the rocket underwent a full-scale rehearsal in preparation for its first flight, including the ignition of the core stage Vulcane 2.1 engine, followed by 470 seconds of stabilized operation covering the entire core stage flight phase, as it would on a real launch to space. This is a major step towards getting Ariane 6 operational. Hopefully, we should see its maiden flight happen sometime in 2024. Kerbal Space Program 2's For Science update is theoretically less than a month away now. Included in this update is the much-anticipated re-entry heating system, and we have some new footage of this in action. Firstly, we have this eye candy of a spacecraft re-entering Kerbin's atmosphere, enduring the heat thanks to its ablative heat shield. And speaking of ablative heat shields, look at this! There are some amazing new charring effects being added in for these, all amounting to the fact that re-entry heating will hopefully be worth the very long wait. Time will tell, I guess. I will definitely bring you lots of content exploring the Kerbal system when Force Science comes out, so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already, and hey, why not check out one of those video suggestions on screen? They're made by me, so they must be good, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for watching, big thanks to my supporters on the left there, and I'll see you all in the next video, which I'm hoping will be my KSP Esports video, which we did in Paris, I missed space this week to do it, so hopefully it was worth it, but anyway, that's the end of the video, goodbye!